the Sermon on the Mount is the keynote address that Jesus gave to his disciples and to the world when he sat down on Mount Aramos and began to teach. The Sermon on the Mount, in fact, everything that Jesus taught is so radically opposed to the way of the world. It is so countercultural that it will always cut across the grain of the world's philosophies, the ways of life that the world accepts and promotes. We're living in a dangerous age. And I say that without apology. This is a dangerous age that we're living in, an age filled with heresies, an age filled with the promotion of everything ungodly and pagan that you can imagine. And not only promoting it, but being broadly accepted Evil is being accepted as good, and good is being accused of being evil in this age that we're living in today. It's a dangerous age. It is at the same time an exciting age because we have the opportunity. There are so many platforms that we have at our disposal to be able to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, I'm out in the out in nature where I love to spend time. So if you see me swatting at a mosquito, or if you hear a mosquito buzzing the camera lens, that's what that is about. Let's look a little bit more into what Jesus taught when he sat down on Mount Aramos to teach his disciples. And what do the scriptures tell us? In Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, the opening, the opening remarks that Jesus makes in his keynote address to us, And seeing the multitudes, he went up, up into a mountain. And when he was set down, his disciples came unto him. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's think about that for a minute. What does it mean? What, what does it mean to mourn? Are we constantly walking around in the world weeping tears in public? Are we constantly broken down in spirit? No, far from it. To mourn, according to what Jesus is telling us, is to have a healthy respect for where we're at in relationship to God and God's will for our lives. He's telling us that we're happy if we will mourn and realize where we are in respect to God and God's will for our lives. One of the things I was thinking about in, in praying over this particular beatitude this morning was how so many times people get caught doing things that they shouldn't. 
How many times are criminals caught breaking the laws, being sent to prison, and they're sorry that they got caught, but they're not sorry for breaking the law? How many times do we hear of a husband or a wife going out cheating on their spouse, violating a moral sacred trust and when they're found out they're sorry that they were caught because of what it cost them in the long run in the way of their reputation in the way of alimony in the way of child support in the way of one thing or another they're sorry because they were caught but they're not sorry because they violated a moral trust they're not sorry because they violated a sacred trust held between a husband and a wife. That's not the type of mourning that Jesus is talking about. The Apostle Paul tells us that there is a type of godly sorrow that we can experience. A type of godly sorrow that leads to repentance that's not to be repented of. In other words, it creates such a change in us when we realize our sinfulness and become sorry for our sinfulness and plead the mercy of God on our behalf. That's what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are they who mourn. And what does he say the promise is? Blessed are they that mourn. Happy are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. They shall receive from God's hand, from the heart of God, the Holy Spirit's administering of the gift of healing, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of encouragement that comes when we realize our sinfulness in the presence of God and call out upon His mercy. St. Benedict tells us in chapter 4 of the rule of St. Benedict that we're to always keep death before our eyes. We're always to contemplate death because in contemplating death we realize our temporal nature and how greatly we need God in our lives. Now, he also tells us not only to keep death before our eyes, but he also tells us in chapter 4, in this chapter on the tools of good works, that we're to constantly remember our past sins. Now, I know that flies in the face of a lot of modern thought. But listen to me for just a second. In doing what Father Benedict tells us, in constantly thinking about death, in not, not morbidly, but realize that life is short and it's going to come to an end for every one of us. And also by continually remembering our sins, telling God about them. It's not that God is judging us for them, but we are reminding ourselves. We're reminding ourselves of how far we had gone before we came back to God. I cannot help but to look upon a crucifix and see the body of Jesus nailed to the cross without thinking about those sins of mine that assisted in putting him there. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Heaven is our goal. Eternal bliss in the presence of God, being united with God for all eternity is our goal. And that's what God desires for us. He wants to comfort us not only here in this life, and there is comfort in 
knowing God in this life a great deal of comfort, especially when things are going so crazily as they are in the world that we live in today. You wake up, you don't know what's going to happen next, and then you know before midday. God comforts us in this life. But even more so, God is more interested in our eternal comfort. And Jesus is telling us that the happiest people, the most blessed people, and that word blessed means happy. The happiest people are those that are poor in spirit, that are meek in spirit, those that mourn. Happy are those that mourn, who realize their the great necessity that they have of God's grace. And they repent of their sins. And not just a once and it's a done deal thing. Our salvation is more than a profession, profession of faith. It's more than a trip down to the altar where we give our heart to Jesus. It's a lifetime salvation. Our, li our salvation is a lifetime of being converted. A lifetime of being saved. And then an eternity thereafter living in union with, in the presence of God who created us. The Apostle James tells us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We don't promote ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We don't promote ourselves in the sight of other people. We humble ourselves before other people. And James tells us that when we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and before people, God will exalt us. God will lift us up. 